Thanks, Polly. Well, I'm, I'm actually not going to speak about my product at all. I, I, I would like to speak to uh, concrete and cement-based composites in general. And in the interest of time, uh, we'll read from something I prepared. Our society is living beyond the means of the earth to sustain it. Our patterns of resource exploitation will dispossess the earth of its natural resources within the space of a few lifetimes. In the next few years, the construction industry must move to an approach which views the earth and its resources as capital to be carefully tended. Balancing society's expenditure of natural and human resources should be a first priority for everyone in the building industry. The key is sustainability, a word which we've heard a lot of today. Sustainability, as defined in the Rio Conference, means providing for the needs of the present without detracting from our ability to fulfill the needs of the future. Indigenous people acted on a concept of stewardship of the Earth's resources for thousands of years, leaving the Earth undamaged by their passage. We can learn from a culture which treats the resources on which it depends for survival as sacred. The reality of sustainability and environmental impact are only beginning to be felt in the building industry. Construction consumes about 40% of U.S. annual resource expenditure. And on the output side, construction and demolition waste account for over 20% of the municipal solid waste stream. Other than structural suitability, the criteria for selecting economical building materials today has largely been based on aesthetic or, or first cost economics. Unfortunately, durability or life cycle considerations are only generally a factor in institutional or high-end commercial construction projects. But as we begin to look more closely at the overall effect of resource use, these criteria must extend to residential construction as well. While we are unlikely to achieve zero impact on the natural environment, the new measure will be how much we can minimize the depletion of our natural resources. We must look at the embodied energy of materials through their life cycles and cradle to grave analysis as discussed earlier. And we must compare the net and cumulative effect of materials on our resources and energy consumption through acquisition, manufacturing, use, and final disposal. But today I want to discuss concrete and other cement-based products as alternative to the non-renewable, energy-consuming, petrochemical-based products widely used in construction. I will also touch upon some of our own work and the future of advanced cement-based composites uh, and building systems, some of which are exhibited here today. And given the short time, try and offer tangible sources and guidelines for using concrete widely. It's important to define the difference between concrete and cement terms, which will be used interchangeably throughout this discussion. To fully appreciate concrete's potential for sustainability, it's helpful to look at its history. Concrete has been used as an architectural material for almost 2,000 years. The earliest evidence of its use is found in the ruins of Roman construction from the first and second centuries AD. These early sites show the remarkable durability and strength of concrete materials. Made with a natural cement mixture of volcanic pozzolana and lime, the ruins of Emperor Hadrian's villa reveal the use of unreinforced concrete in the construction of domes and walls. In fact, in some instances, walls made of stone or brick were filled with concrete to more effectively mortar the stone. Today, archaeologists find that the concrete filling remains long after the stone and brick have, in fact, disappeared. Following the fall of Rome, knowledge of concrete construction was lost until the latter half of the 18th century. Its modern counterpart surfaced in 1824 when Joseph Asbin, an English stonemason, patented a manufactured cement he called Portland cement. It was so named because it resembled a fine, highly valued building stone quarried on the Isle of Portland off the coast of England. Concrete has three major components, aggregates, water, and Portland cement. The aggregates are usually a mixture of coarse and fine materials such as gravel or crushed stone and sand. In a process called hydration, Portland cement and water combine chemically to bind those materials together. The resulting concrete is a rock-like mass with remarkable strength and durability. Beyond concrete, three basic components modifying agents called admixtures can either retard or advance setting time. 
provide resistance to freeze thaw damage, enhance strength, improve placing characteristics, and add color. Two characteristics of concrete account for its use as the most widely used building material on Earth. Its remarkable compression strength and its ability to be shaped in a variety of different applications. Concrete used in construction typically has a compressive strength of between 3 to 6,000 psi. Newer formulations can exceed compressive strengths of 20,000 psi, and new advanced cement-based composites have been tested at over 100,000 pounds per square inch. Such strength means that relatively small concrete components can, su can support tremendous loads. It can also be formed into structural shapes that accommodate both strength and aesthetic value with great economy can be precast and delivered to the construction site or cast directly in place or used as masonry components or as a finishing material. Cement is made up of Earth's most, ab most abundant and universally available raw minerals in containing limestone, chalk, and shale, which are blended and heated to about 2,700 degrees in an industrial furnace called a kiln. The conversion of these raw materials into cement consume large amounts of energy. But to mitigate its environmental impact, the cement supplements, cement industry really supplements fossil fuels with high energy waste, such as used scrap tires from automobiles, which have an energy content uh, rivaling that of, sto of coal. Each cement kiln can consume over one million tires each year, which obviously displaces them from the landfill and saves coal. Other common waste fuels include used motor oils, spent solvents, printing inks, paints, cleaning fluids. Indeed, for some chemicals, thermal destruction in a cement kiln is the safest method of disposal. The kiln's intense heat, nearly twice as hot as a municipal incinerator, plus its long residence time and turbulence within the kiln, ensure complete destruction of the waste. The process is strictly controlled and monitored by the EPA, and it is estimated that waste fuel will eventually supply up to 50 percent of the energy required to manufacture cement. The cement industry in general has, in fact, reduced fossil fuel consumption by 77 percent in the last 20 years. Cement only it represents only about 9 to 13 percent by volume of concrete, but it accounts for 92 percent of the embodied energy. Aggregates of sand represent under 2%, crushed stone under 6%. So obviously, minimizing the percentage of cement will ultimately lower the embodied energy of concrete. Concrete itself is an ideal matrix in which to recycle and encapsulate a wide range of industrial and consumer waste. Industrial byproducts include readily available pozzolans, such as fly ash, produced by coal combustion at electric utilities, and silica fume, a byproduct of silicone and steel manufacturing. These materials increase the strength of concrete while recycling industrial waste and minimizing cement consumption. Use of fly ash and concrete already saves about 44 million BTUs of energy annually in the U.S. alone. Increasing the rate of fly ash from 9 to 25 percent would save an additional 75 trillion BTU, BTUs per year. Fly ash can be substituted for 15 to 35 percent of cement. According to a recent EPA study, some applications such as autoclave cellular concrete, which is now being developed here in the United States, can contain up to 70 percent. And of the 51 million tons of fly ash produced in 1991, only 7.7 .7 million tons were used, which only represents 9 percent of the consumption of fly ash in general. Many other consumer and industrial ways can be recycled as aggregate. Reground polystyrene from packaging, ground porcelain from recycled plumbing fixtures, glass, plastic, wood, and, meta and metallic pieces, or even lightweight aggregate made from municipal sludge can be extracted from society's waste stream and used as raw materials for concrete. We need to close the loop by reusing materials that we have traditionally discarded into the landfill because recycling is not just collection. Aside from resource efficiency, energy, and recycling concerns, construction itself is a significant waste-generating industry. 
I mentioned earlier that construction waste and rubble from demolition account for 20% of municipal solid waste. Here again, we must reevaluate our current building systems, the fitting and assembly of sheet goods and lumber to produce scrap. We must dramatically change the way we build. The cycle of wood construction is not sustainable. Until now, long-run consequences haven't been enough to galvanize the construction industry into action. But today's skyrocketing lumber prices have finally forced the search for alternatives. According to the National Association of Home Builders, the recent jump in lumber price, prices translates into an increase of more than $4,500 in the cost of building a new home. Every time you build a house, you use 41 trees. 23 go to the construction of floors and walls, 13 to the roof, and 5 to the interior. The New World's bounty of timber resources made North America one of the last regions of the world to cling to wood construction. Basic U.S. construction practices have not changed in more than 50 years. Hopefully, this new administration's commitment to responsible environmental practice will guarantee that a new force will continue to affect this traditional cycle. Unlike U.S. building methods, concrete is used only on an as-needed basis. There is no inventory, waste of material, and it minimizes scrap and disposal. Precast concrete has the environmental benefit of being able to handle all the dry materials and water effluents in a concentrated facility. And today's formwork can be reused, or in the case of modern integrated forming systems, can stay in place as insulation or a finished wall. Cement and concrete supplies are highly local or regional. Ultimate energy of fuel requirements for handling or transportation are very low. Cement is usually shipped within a 50 mile radius of its production. And ready mix concrete and concrete products are supplied even more locally. In contrast, wood and steel products are routine, routinely shipped across the country in their journey from forest and mill to the job site. We can both reduce waste and debris from demolition and conserve resources by simply building longer lasting, more durable structures. Concrete service life exceeds that of other comparable products used in construction today, such as wood, steel, and brick. In fact, con concrete compares very well to these other materials and its use of energy consumed. At the end of its service life, concrete can be recycled and reused by crushing into aggregates for new concrete or as fill for roadbeds or side, side works. Concrete boasts excellent thermal properties, and the fact that it can store and re-radiate heat means that buildings of concrete naturally require 70% less energy for heating and cooling than buildings constructed of other materials. Concrete promotes a healthier indoor atmosphere since it is one of the most chemically inert materials and requires no VOC compound-based coatings or preservatives. It's naturally waterproof, fire-resistant. Unlike wood and steel, it will not decay or deteriorate. Concrete does not require paint to achieve color. In addition to the benefits of conventional concrete outlined above, a new generation of cement-based materials heralds a new philosophy of building and these new concrete materials rely on the use of byproducts from other industrial processes, post-consumer waste, and reduce the overall waste stream by exploiting materials that have been considered waste. And in conclusion, I just wanted to highlight a few quick tips in specifying and using cement and concrete wisely. Consider slab on grade and pure foundation systems. This replaces the whole concept of the raised floor system minimizing lumber framing and sheathing and flooring, and opens opportunities to leave the slab exposed and take advantage of its thermal mass and radiant heating options. Two, consider precast systems. This minimizes disposable forming, wash water runoff, on-site environmental site damage, and concrete overage. Three, consider in-place forming systems and integrated panelizing or masonry systems, CMU, to minimize scrap, and additional labor to install this thermal and moisture and interior and exterior finishes. Specify minimal admixture use to, to minimize off-gassing. Specify fly ash, consider recycled aggregates, consider gray water as used as water. Utilize existing concrete as site work as rubble. And those are just a few. And in, in closing, I'd just like to say, read a quote from Albert Einstein that says that 
we cannot solve today's problems with the same level of thinking that created them. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Cap to discuss wood, recycled wood, and sustainable harvesting. I should have had a mic, but no, that's right. I can't uh, pull the materials into it, so I'll try to just uh, go through this. Become. Just do that. That's good. Um, wood's become kind of a uh, uh, one of those materials that everybody says we shouldn't use anymore. But we are talking about using recycled materials these days and sustainable materials. And in 10 minutes, I sure can't tell you what that means. Sustainable is a very big topic, tropical, temperate. There's a lot of things that go into it. But I'm going to show you some products today that uh, may be recycled, maybe some new products that we'll be seeing in the future, and try to tell you a little bit about what's going on with sustainability, tropical and temperate. Um, first thing is recycled. Yeah, maybe we can stand over. Stand over here. Yeah, there you go. First thing is recycled is uh, not for the weak at heart. Um, I've been recycling for five or six years now, built some million dollar houses and a number of things. And what we're talking about doing is. <clears throat> changing this ugly piece of wood, which is uh, very problematic, a lot of labor, a lot of time frame and planning to turn out a finished product like this. There's a long, there's a long sp space of time in between that. I had to develop my own construction and uh, architecture company just to do it because it was so problematic. I couldn't get builders to use it. I couldn't get architects to design with it because it's too difficult to come come up with the raw materials. They're not standard. They're not on the shelf. We have to go through a long process to get to them. So that's it for recycle. The other thing is specifications. You really should try to educate yourself about products that are available and what the prices are and how they fit into different kinds of uses in a project. For instance, when we use the word pine, uh, a number of things come to mind. Um, Here's six different products, seven different products. Uh, this first one is antique, or this is white pine. This recycled from old timbers. Uh, this is antique southern yellow pine, which is recycled from old timbers and buildings. But varying degrees of price is $2 a foot and $6 a foot. When we say pine, sometimes we say heart pine or Caribbean pine. This is heart pine, but it may not be certified. It may be from second growth. This is heart pine or Caribbean pine, but it's actually from sustainable forestry operations that we're working on in Honduras. Um, this is also maybe sustainable, being that it's second or third growth, and it's southern yellow pine, but this is $800 a thousand or 80 cents a foot, and this material might be $8 a foot or $4 a foot. So there's a real varying degree of cost and specification. This is recycled pine, but it's $20 a foot, and it's antique pine. So when you say pine, be very clear what you're, what you're talking about, where the materials are going to come from, if they are available, if certification is the issue. I don't think there's uh, two or three products that are certified in, in the sustainable or in the recycled industry right now. These are some other products that are sort of new technology. Uh, it's a very lightweight product. It's used to uh, revegetate coal strip mining. It's called Paulonia. 
It grows six to 10 feet a year, and it also helps the environment. At the same time, the Japanese and the Asian uh, community really like it as a veneer product because it's, it's got a very nice quality. Here's another product after utilization as a rubber tree for latex production for years. They cut the final tree at, at the end of its life and then laminate it into five laminations an eighth inch thick and create a really hard durable flooring product. Here's another product that's made from waste veneers. It's not, uh, in this case it's post-industrial, it's not post-consumer, so it probably won't get certified. But on the front side, you can see all the laminated veneers. It's actually waste from a plywood manufacturing op operation. This product is a woodblock floor, and it could be recycled. It, it al also could be post-industrial, but it's actually in cuts of short pieces of wood that are found in the industry stored all over the place and made into a really uh, durable commercial flooring product. These products all may range from three to ten dollars a foot, so you have to be very careful. Educate yourself because you're asking a builder and the material supplier not only to find the product, but to install it based on his, the kindness of his heart or the greenness of his, his uh, you know, sense. Um, and then we get into tropical hardwoods. Um, tropical hardwoods is... Uh, I don't know how many of you are still boycotting tropical hardwoods, but we have to solve these problems. Rather than boycotting, I think we have to get very active in development of sustainable systems internationally. I'm doing a lot of work in Central and South America, but at this point, this is what's sustainable um, in tropical hardwoods. None of, them, none of these are certified. None of them have met the guidelines for tropical forest uh, certification. They all have a lot of different um, good points and bad points, but when you get into the actual sustainable development of the programs in these foreign countries, the problems become much more complex than they are when we look at temperate forest uh, sustainability. And in actuality, we're going much further beyond this. Some of the projects I'm working on in Bolivia and Honduras are actually trying to use uh, lesser known species rather than the typical trees that we've learned to use in the past. But the other things we're doing are trying to develop what they call sustainable products uh, so that they can create the value added for a lot of the people that live in these cultures, as well as in our communities. This particular little chair is a prototype for a product line we're doing in Santa Fe. But it'll be done in a uh, native Indian community in, in the United States. It'll also be done in a spot in Honduras and Panama. The idea is that this product and others like it utilize thinnings from plantation forest projects. They also use natural products for the rush seat. And literally everything is made without tools, without power. There are, there are no power tools and no power required to make this. It also creates a, a, you know, a labor base and an economic base for those small communities around South and Central America. I think that's 10, is that close? Well, certification is, uh, it was the last thing on my list because I always ask the question, are you all willing to pay 10 or 15 percent for certification? And if so, um, we need to somehow solve a lot of the problems that go along with the certification problem because I'm working with World Wildlife Fund and USAID and all these different organizations around the world that are attempting to solve problems that as we sit here in our comfort and Saturday afternoon uh, sort of attitude uh, about the world, not knowing what third world really looks like and feels like, it's very hard to juxtapose uh, uh, all, the, all the criteria that goes into certification and make it work for a product. Uh, for instance, I showed this chair to somebody yesterday and I showed the pictures that went along with it and the person that was lashing the seat together out of the suyate was a 12-year-old child. Part of a community of 150 people in a cooperative that are making different kinds of products. But what's going to happen? He said, well, that's, you're using child labor, you know? <laughs> so every single issue that comes up that we can really easily uh, you know, kind of gloss over uh, in the United States, when you get into a third world country, we're talking about whole totally different issues. The Bolivian forest and the Brazilian forest are being burnt down because 
they, they can get free land, 50 hectares, if they burn the land down and plant rice. Well, two years later, that rice turns to erosion, and then there's nothing left. And so we have to solve problems about food, about uh, economics, about the future, before we can really solve what this sustainable thing is. And in essence, uh, tropical hardwoods uh, is about all that's left. There's less than 7 or 8% of the temperate forest in the, in the United States, in the West, anyway. And now we're into Russia, where we have a quarter of the world's forest, and they're taking it down just as fast as they took down the forest in, in the northern Northwest. So it's a big issue. I think you all should really try to educate yourselves as well as possible. Find different ways to include these products on a sustainable basis. We can't give these to Kmart and Walmart and people like that because what they do is buy such large quantities of materials that it's not sustainable anymore. It has to be done. We have to look at this resource on a different level. We have to split and pull veneers and start to do things that are totally uh, engineered instead of this solid wood product that we're used to using in our industry. Thanks. Michael's cleaning off his desk. I just to like to make an announcement uh, that was handed to me by Lynn Bayless of the EOS Institute, and that is that Nader Khalili will be speaking on May 26th at uh, the AIA in Costa Mesa, 3200 Park Center Drive. Nader Khalili is uh, um, a very exciting an interesting architect dealing with earth structures. Our next speaker is Eve Montana. Eve is an interior designer who did the Calabasas City Hall and we'll let you know her su successes and um, other things <laughs> on uh, Calabasas City Hall. I took my slides this week with my home camera one year and two months after the move-in date. I'm going to read my talk because I have a tendency to ramble <laughs> and it, I timed it and it's only eight minutes and that'll make Polly happy. So uh, can I have the first slide please? The new Calabasas City Hall is located on Malibu Canyon Road, just east of the Ventura Freeway, in a new second floor, 10,000 square foot space developed by Amundsen. Next. The city of Calabasas is an ecologically conscious community. As environmental design consultant, I was asked by the mayor to advocate the following goals. Non-toxicity from VOCs, dust mites, viruses, pollen, and all the rest, energy efficiency, recycling, and cradle-to-grave analysis. The developer had given us his standard $30 square foot tenant improvement budget with which to plan our build-out. Obviously, this meant we would be forced to compromise and face the reality of compensating with the muni municipal budget while considering the opinion of the community whose tax dollars we were spending. Hence, I call this talk, To Do or Not To Do, Decisions on an Environmental Tenant Improvement Budget. First, we needed to confront the ideals we could not accomplish. Although eliminating carpet would eliminate its VOCs, its blues, and its dust and mold, we were forced to use it for acoustical reasons. We were on the second floor. The first floor was already occupied by a business. We could not use a non-toxic carpet because of cost, which is astronomical for a commercial job, and availability is almost non-existent. Even if we chose a wool carpet, there is always the problem of allergies to wool, which cannot be predicted in a public space. 
Therefore, we had no choice but to use a standard commercial carpet. But we could, however, substitute the very toxic carpet glue for a water-based glue. Today, one year later, the carpet and the glue are doing well. The water-based glue holds up to cleaning. Slide. In the coffee, copy, and storage room, we replaced vinyl tiles with natural linoleum tiles made by Forbo. Although this product is non-toxic, the trade-off is its wearability. As you can see from this slide, yes you can, every scuff and scratch shows, and this occurred from day one of installation. So if you have major concern for appearance, as opposed to just plain usage, I would not suggest using this product. However, this is one of the philosophical trade-offs, and patina was once considered very attractive. Two, we could not improve on daylighting. The developer had no interest in providing us with skylighting. Windows were our only access to daylight. Next. Three, we could not eliminate commercial furnishings. The budget with this, which the city council allocated was modest. Custom-built furniture using non-toxic finishes and glues was prohibited, as is, not, as, as is non-existent and is non-existent in a commercial line. Uh, next. But what we could do was investigate commercial furniture companies and request cradle-to-grave analysis from them with emphasis on the health and safety of their manufacturing plants, their policy on woods, and their shipping methods. We chose Hayworth. Four, we could not do a bake-out. Because the first floor was already occupied, raising the temperature over 120 degrees for several days, and then allowing for cool down was impossible, and it would delay our move-in date, already behind schedule, at least two more weeks. Slide. What we could do was, one, substitute non-toxic uh, non paint for both toxic paint and wall coverings. The trade-off, again, is wearability. How would the paint hold up to time and to the public? I, w I am happy to say, one year later, the corridor has been spot painted only once from ch children's pencil marks. The coverage from the Miller paint that we used was excellent. Even the painters felt the difference. They were not going home with headaches and burning eyes after a day of painting. And after all, the craftsmen are part of the public we want to keep healthy. I might also add, add, we eliminated any use of fiberglass insulation for acoustics for the very same reason. Once in place, it is relatively harmless. However, it is devastating to the drywall wall crew. Next. The only place we chose to put any type of wall covering was in the council chamber on a select wall where pinups by the community are necessary. Here we have a typical example of community pinups. Next, recycling art by local school children for their Earth Day celebrations. Next, water-based glues were used along with Medite, a non-toxic particle board for millwork. Next, we chose not to eliminate laminates for countertops because of cost factors and, again, durability. Uh, next, HEPA filters were placed in strategic areas to eliminate any leftover VOCs, viruses, bacterias, and dust. These filters, traditionally used in medical surgery rooms, are relatively expensive but worth the cost. The developer fought this, however. The council voted to use taxpayer dollars since the community would be actively using the space. 
Uh, next. Not only does it contain the city managerial offices, but also building and safety. This is the back of building and safety. Building and safety, a public library, and conference rooms for local groups, tutoring, and so forth. Next. Incandescent light was replaced by full spectrum fluorescent and also compact fluorescent. Fluorescent for energy efficiency and full spectrum for health and human factors. Also, low voltage replaced spots for energy efficiency. Uh, next. Recycling bins were supplied in the coffee room, and I am happy to report are being used. In a TI job, availability and time are of the utmost importance. If a product cannot be shipped from Holland for six months, you can't use it. Subcontractors, in an effort to bid low, may not read your specifications and assume they can use their standard glues or particle board and will call you the last minute to say they can't afford to do the job with what you specified or they won't be able to meet the deadline because they have not ordered the specified material. These problems must have immediate alternatives. Sometimes products advertised as green can be as misleading as food products labeled light. Look at their cost and compare them to what's already out there. And the most important of all issues, put pressure on the manufacturers, especially carpet manufacturers, to provide toxic-free product that goes beyond the minimal standards. Refuse to use the products until they do so. Economic pressure works. Xerox did it when they wanted a paper company to supply them with recycled paper, and we can do it. As architects and designers, we can act as a political force to encourage manufacturers to change. I'd like to publicly thank the Calabasas City Council and the city manager for allowing me to do this project. Thank you. I'd like to publicly thank the audiovisual team. They're doing a great job. Um, our next speaker is John Carter from Gensler Associates. And is Deborah, Deborah going to come up too? OK. And Deborah Deming. Uh, Gensler has a dedicated team that works to educate their designers and their clients in environmental materials and do environmental specifications. Thank you, Polly. I'm John Carter with Kensler Associates. Um, I'm an architect and a specifier. And this is Deborah Deming. Deborah's a designer. And first, Deborah's going to start by telling you a little about what our environmental committee is in house and what we do. Hi. It's nice to see such a turnout. I want to thank Polly again for inviting us to be here. And to start, about a year ago, there was a group of us in-house that were very active on a personal level regarding the environment. And we got together and decided how we could affect what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as architects and designers. So from a handful of people, we formed a group. And a year later, we're still a group. And we're starting to affect other Gensler offices around the country. We felt since Gensler is a corporation that and given our size, we could definitely have an influence on manufacturers. So as a group, our emphasis has been on educating our clients as well as our peers and also talking with manufacturers on how they can affect their manufacturing methods and change their products to make them more environmentally uh, friendly products. 
So as a group, we've basically just been meeting on a regular basis to educate one another and just create a foundation and build up a resource center. And we've also implemented checklists for our designers and architects that can be used from the start of a project through the end and also um, various questionnaires that are used in the programming stages with clients to see how far they want to take the environmental issues within their projects. Um, I want to allow most of the time for John because he's going to get into specifications. But before I do that, I just want to read a quote that is something that our group feels very strongly about. It's from Biologic by David Wan. Environmental deterioration is a lack of relevant information. Poor design is responsible for many, if not most, of our environmental problems. Given the relevant information, architects can consider environmental factors in their designs and can resist, I'm sorry, assist the clients in making environmentally sound decisions. So I'm going to let John talk about specifications. One of the main focuses of our committee is to do research and to come up with lists and ideas of uh, products and procedures. Uh, primarily right now we're focusing on recycled content materials, materials that have lower than normal toxicity, and also uh, recycling of demolition waste. In the future we hope to get into other areas such as energy efficiency. Uh, at any rate, uh, once we find these, um, these wish, list, wish list ideas, the next step is to do research, and the third step is to do implementation. And this, just to remind you all, this is what implementation is all about to us. This is a project manual, and this, with this legal document, this is the power that you can use in the field to actually get your products onto a job site. Without this, uh, it's hit or miss. Now I want to talk a little about some of the fears that we have in implementing. Uh, our committee came up with a lot of products that, that we felt were important, but gee, we really weren't sure. We weren't sure exactly uh, what was going to come out of some of these products. We weren't sure if they were durable, et cetera. The, the three things we were really concerned with on a project were cost, durability, and schedule. And um, I think John Picard can testify to the fact that schedule on projects he's worked on has, has been an item that if the contractor does not buy into the concept of scheduling a project for your environmental projects and procedures, then it simply won't happen. Uh, the client has to move in, and, and a lot of times that's what really drives the project. I'd like to talk about cost. Uh, we've implemented on several large projects now what we consider to be environmental materials and processes, and the cost data is finally coming in in, in, a, in a manner that we can analyze it. And from what I can tell so far, most items and processes that we're specifying really don't cost more. They do not cost your client more money. A few of them do, a, a very, very few of them do, but um, our approach is to get the owner to buy into the concept of bidding these items as an alternate. It's easy for the owner to say up front, well, okay, as long as I have a chance to change my mind later, I'll go along with it for now. And then once you get the prices in, they can sit down and see in, in very real dollars what they're paying for a particular process. And I think that's very important. Um, Another thing that, that we're all concerned about and scared about, in fact, is, is durability or quality. And uh, one way that we are working with this problem is to talk to our clients up front and help them understand that we have to redefine quality. Uh, in the past, quality has been the most durable material that money can buy. In the future, quality must be redefined as the most durable, sustainable, environmentally responsible material that money can buy. And that's very important, I think, to, uh, to allowing us to, to have the, the courage to go forward with recommending these products to our owners, is to have them buy into this concept. A little about schedule. Uh, implementation of environmental products uh, 
it's, it's crucial to get the contractor involved in this. Um, many times uh, implementation can be undermined by the lack of planning on the part of the contractor and the subcontractor. In negotiated contracts, we insist on a contractor that is sympathetic to the environment, to our needs, and to the owner's needs. Um, we are fortunate in that at Gensler, most of our contracts are negotiated with the contractors. We usually recommend the contract going into the to the contractor going into the project. In bid contracts, however, uh, one thing that you can do is to require an implementation plan as part of the bidding requirements, so that when you analyze the bid before you select the successful contractor, you have an opportunity to see how he intends to implement your needs into his schedule. I want to talk for just a few minutes about the, uh, the, the first from the ground up environmental project that Gensler has been involved in. Uh, we were involved in the Sony Pictures, which I will let John Picard elaborate on later because he was closely involved in that, uh, which was a project where uh, I'd say midway through the project, John was fortunate enough to get in over at Sony and help them out. Uh, the HBO project came to us, and this is a renovation in Century City. It's about 65,000 square feet, two, the two top floors of the, of the Century City Tower, one of the towers. Uh, at that time, our committee in-house was searching for the courage to approach a client with a questionnaire that Deborah mentioned earlier. We were postured to try it out on HBO, and we were, in fact, sitting in, a, in an early client meeting when the client brought it up before we did. So we knew we were off to a good start there. We sat down with the client, and they had ideas that they had used on previous projects, and we had ideas that we'd used on previous projects. And we sat down and had a brainstorming session and came up with a list. And here's the list that we started with. Our wish list for the project was to recycle demolition materials, to use low biocide, low fungicide, low VOC paint, permit carpet off-gassing prior to placing the carpet inside the sealed space, use low toxicity carpet adhesives, use solution dyed carpeting, which we believe is more environmentally friendly at the source of the manufacturer, use steel studs with recycled content, use gypsum board with recycled content, and recycled recycled paper face. Also, we, uh, we had the concept of trying to save existing construction wherever possible, and uh, we, in fact, designed the interior of the renovation around the existing partitions as much as possible. Uh, there was also a, a plan established to refurbish e existing furniture and sell off existing excess furniture and uh, supplement with new furniture where necessary. And originally, we had the concept of reusing the existing ceiling system, saving 60-some thousand square feet of ceiling tile. That one, by the way, went by the wayside. That one did not, did not pan out. We also proposed to use linoleum instead of VC tile flooring. That one was later rejected due to durability and cost. Um, a little about the process. Um, it went fairly smoothly during the bidding process when the subcontractors were bidding. I got uh, hate mail and phone calls from every carpet installer in the industry. Uh, they absolutely were not set up to, to find a warehouse, to off-gas the carpet. They fought us every inch of the way. We uh, still haven't totally won the battle on that one. They, they are supposed to do it, but, but I've actually got to see them do it before I believe that it will happen. In retrospect, though, the process was easy to perform. Uh, we did not we did not recommend this process because we were going to make money on it. In fact, it costs us money to do this as designers. But uh, we hope in the future, the more that we get accustomed to doing it, it won't cost us money to do it. And it won't cost the contractor money to implement it either. Uh, but I do want to point out that the teamwork is, is the most important aspect of this. I want to give environmental contracting a lot of credit for making it happen and home box office a lot of credit for having it as a corporate policy. Now I want to put on my other hat, now that Polly says I have two minutes left, uh, 
I am also here to represent the Los Angeles chapter of the Construction Specifications Institute, otherwise known as CSI. The LA chapter of CSI has established an Environmental Concerns Committee that meets once a month in Gensler's offices in Santa Monica, and the public is invited. I'd like to read from you, read you our mission statement. Perform research, evaluate, and provide information to, mem to members, building design firms, and the public at large on the following. Building products that can contain recycled content or which are resource efficient, better ways to manage construction and demolition waste, materials, equipment, and methods of construction for optimum energy efficiency in building design and construction, safety, health considerations, and toxicity of building products. Number two, provide public education and technical assistance and make presentations about environmental concerns or committee activities to members, design firms, and the public, all free of charge. Number three, contribute to CSI newsletters, newsletters and other CSI publications and other professional journals on a regular basis to get the word out. I am uh, co-chairman of this committee. Kelly Ingalls is chairman of the committee, and most of you will see Kelly's, one of Kelly's and John Picard's joint efforts here today. This is a free handout that you'll see in the next room. So uh, uh, we want to, I want to thank John, I guess, for getting these here today, because I know Kelly's not here. The uh, CSI committee meets every third Wednesday of the month, as, as I said, at Gensler's office in Santa Monica. Membership in CSI is not required. If anyone's interested, see me after this meeting, and I'll give you uh, some cards where you can call me, and uh, we'll get you on our mailing list, if nothing else. And um, one last item. CSI is sponsoring a CSI night in Pasadena. This is a product show, May 26th and they will have a green room for display of environmental products. Call me if you want more information. Thank you all for coming. Now, we are running a half an hour late. Uh, our next three speakers are Mark Bush, Terry Kennedy, and Julia Russell. Uh, do, do we want to break for lunch first? Would that be possible, or shall we go straight through and dedicate after lunch the round tables? Straight through? Okay, good. I like that. Um, by the way, I think Garth Sheriff actually got the LA Networks here along with all the other free handouts, or most of them, so uh, I thank Garth for that particularly. Um, so, Mark Bush is going to tell us how to recycle on our construction site. Mark is the Senior Environmental Control Engineer for Northrop. Mark. Thanks, Polly. I, um, I need to kind of clarify something. I am one of a number of environmental control engineers. I'm one of a number of environmental control engineers at Northrop Aircraft. Um, actually, I'm a trainer for Northrop. I'm neither an environmental professional, nor am I familiar with the building industry, so why am I talking about recycling of construction materials? In fact, the only experience I have with the construction industry is watching this old house on television. Um, in fact, um, that kind of reminds me of something else. This old house reminds me of Norm Abrams, and like Norm says on New Yankee Workshop, a full list of drawings and specifications will be available to you. In the blue folder that you've been provided, there is a set of all the view graphs that I'll be showing. What I'd like to talk about first, and Francis, if you could put the first view graph up, is composition of landfill. As you know, Senate Bill 939 mandates that we reduce hazardous, I'm sorry, we reduce the disposal of material into landfill by 25% by the year 1995 and 50% by the year 2000. Now that's a mandate placed upon cities by the state. It's not placed upon individuals or companies. But as responsible members of a community, it does become our job. And as you can see here, in terms of percentages, 
almost 60% of all waste going into landfill could be related to the construction industry. We have 9% dirt, 25% uh, landscape debris. A lot of that's lawn clippings. A lot of that is leaves that come from homes. But there is some landscape debris that's part of that as well. And 25% is actual construction materials, the wood, the metal, and the concrete that uh, three speakers have spoken about before. And I'd like to concentrate on that 50%. Uh, dirt's been discussed too as being used for residual landfill and that uh, in construction and that's a very useful option as well. As far as uh, metals go, and Francis, let's, let's put the next one up there. You'll find that metal recyclers tend to be probably the most dominant of the three recycling uh, agencies that we'll be talking about today. Metal recyclers have been around for a long time. As, so, as long as people have discovered that you can make aluminum cans out of discarded aluminum and tin cans out of discarded tin, we've had recycling. It goes back to the 1940s. There is now a growing market for the recycling of construction grade metals as well. The problem here is that because these folks have been around for a while, they've learned a lot of the tricks. And I'm being straightforward with you. They have tricks of the trade. They will light the way you light in, in some cases. They may charge you for roll-off and pickup, and the most useful, and many of the, mo of the more long-standing companies don't do that. They'll provide roll-offs for you free of charge, they'll provide pickup for you free of charge, and then deduct a percentage of your total uh, return to pay for that. So you have no upfront payout, or you shouldn't. Also, though, when you're dealing with metals, this is where a lot of human resources efforts come in. When you're dealing with the crews that work in your area, that are working on your site, they need to be instructed on the fact that you are recycling. Some people are going to say, hey, I've been a hammer pusher for 20 years. What's this recycling ecology stuff? I don't need that. And of course, they may use a word other than stuff to describe their feelings. Um, you all know what I mean. It's commonly called solid waste. They may, though, if they're motivated, if they're told why it's important to recycle these metals, they'll learn to do things like uh, segregate the waste properly. A recycler will only accept about 1% contamination in any, in any roll-off load for you to get the maximum return. And if financial return on your, on your cost is a, is a consideration for you, then that's something that needs to be enforced. With these bins, though, there's a certain amount of contamination that will occur, and the recycler will accept that as long as it stays Below, um, at or below a 1% level. The biggest problem, though, in this case is that many of the metals that are discarded, often by very well-meaning personnel, uh, can be contaminated. By that I would mean uh, paint cans, aerosol spray containers, materials that may have some con uh, residual contamination on them. In those cases, those materials cannot be disposed of as recyclable waste unless they meet what's called the California Empty Standard. California empty means that if I take a container and I invert it and turn any number of ways, there is no residual spill coming out of that container. Now, this applies specifically for materials that may be designated as hazardous. Uh, and again, paint, solvents, strippers, thinners, adhesive, inks, dyes would all be considered in many cases hazardous material. When you no longer want them or need them, they become hazardous waste and they have to be disposed of according to DTSC. DTSC. Now, that's not a bad name for someone, that's an actual organization. Department of Toxic Substance Control. And DITC guidelines are very specific. These are mandated under the 40th Code of, of Federal Regulations and under Title 22 of the California Administrative Code. So those guidelines, if you're gonna be recycling metals that may be contaminated, have to be followed. Uh, I guess we'll need the next slide. We had talked about wood recycling, and now I'm breaking this down into two different components. I'm talking about construction grade wood and also the landscape debris that may be cleared from a site. Many of these can be sent to wood recyclers, and I'm not talking here about actual reuse of lumber where the wood is refabricated and put into use again for construction. Wood recyclers will actually grind up the wood into a very fine pulp, and then this is either sold or given free of charge as a mulch to uh, communities, to schools, to individuals. The problem here, which, or something that you may want to investigate, is that they will also charge you for that. They'll charge you by the roll-off load or the truck load. And these materials then, 
become a cost factor for you, which you can either absorb or pass on to your client. And either one's a very attractive option. The other option then is reuse of the wood. And here what we'd be talking about would be things, uh, well at Northrop for example, we have what you might call a pallet hospital. All of the pallets that may have a broken stave on them are sent to one location. And then they're gutted and reused. We recycle somewhere around 5,000 pallets per year this way by taking just the broken pieces and, and, and re recycling them and reusing the rest of the pallet. We found for ourselves that reuse is a much more efficient way to utilize materials than to go through a recycling operation. It involves less transportation, and when you're dealing with transportation, you're dealing with the, uh, the burning of fossil fuels to, to power the vehicle, which means more nitrogen oxide in the air. It also involves the, um, the actual manufacturing operation, the smelting operation if you're dealing with recycling of metal, the fabrication or defabrication operations if you're dealing with wood. And we find this is a much more efficient way to go. Uh, the LA, and now LA County is, is setting up a program, I'm sorry, or LA City, excuse me, is setting up a program where they are looking at uh, a, something very similar to what's going on in a lot of the East Coast uh, states, where they will recycle the material at uh, about 25 cents per bag of green waste. So again, it's a charge to you, but it's very minimal, something that the city subsidizes. In a way, it's not unlike what is going on now in LA County, if you're familiar with it, with the Christmas trees that they're disposing of every year, where you take them to a designated site and it's all ground up and people walk, go away with a couple of bags of seeds. Uh, Francis, can I have the next one, please? When you're dealing with cement or concrete, uh, earlier it was mentioned that this can be used as an aggregate. I would recommend that to, if you're involved in any planning operations, uh, if you're a professional planner, city planner, any kind of planner, we would recommend, we would urge that you consider the use of crushed, uh, of crushed recycled concrete as the fill, as the aggregate to be used. In 90% of the cases, the specific specification for road fill is crushed granite. As soon as that spec, as you know, goes, gets onto paper, that's what you're tied to. Even if someone wa wanted to be use a more environmentally friendly alternative, there's no op op option for that. What we recommend then is that if possible, if you can get the buy off on it, to specify crushed, recycled concrete as your aggregate fill. Uh, the point here is that we're not just working to close the loop, we're working to create a market so that the loop can be closed. Right now we're sending out this stuff to be recycled and there's no market for it. As such, it creates a disincentive for that market to continue. And as far as a cost factor, as you can see, it saves three to four dollars a ton on crushed ag over crushed granite. So it's cheaper for your customer and it's also environmentally friendly. I just have a couple more slides here, Francis, I think we'll need the next one. Next question is, if you're going to recycle, how do you do it? Who do you go to? I would recommend that in most cases it would be very easy to develop a relationship with a number of very reputable recyclers. And, the, and unlike in the uh, household recycling arena, where a recycler will accept any of a number of commingled materials, in the construction field, the recyclers tend to be very specialized. You'll have people who recycle metals and metals exclusively, people who recycle wood and wood exclusively. You have concrete and asphalt recyclers, and each one operates in their own field of expertise. You may want to go to, to use the services of a broker who operates very much like a travel agent, if you will, for your recycling operations. He or she will look through the market, see who's there, and for a fee will set up operations for you and act as a middleman between the job site and the recycling center. If the job is a very large one, a very complicated one, one that involves a number of different materials, you may want to consider using a broker. You'll find that the amount of time that is saved on your part is more than worth the cost, uh, more than worth the cost of the broker. In most other cases, though, if you're not dealing with large quantities of materials, a large number of different waste streams, or a, a, a large-scale job, with a number of different people working on it, you may want to consider just recycling yourself. 
Now, how do you find a good and reliable broker? What are some things to consider? Well, you want to make sure that if you have a waste pickup scheduled, that pickup occurs. You, you don't want to have a, dr a dumpster, 40-yard, 60-yard dumpster sitting on your site, taking up space, creating hazards for in the workplace for, for days and days and days. So timeliness becomes an important factor. Reliability, also in terms of weights and measures, becomes an important factor, especially if you're going to be charged by the pound or by the ton, and that price is offset by the rental of the, the dumpster and the transportation of the material away from your site. Uh, most of those additional services, such as the dump, dumpster provision or roll-off provision and the provision of transportation of the material off the site, should be included as part of the, the additional services that are provided for you. You shouldn't have to pay for that. Um, you may want to go to city and state agencies. You have here in ADPSR a very, very strong network for providing you with referrals for providers of waste of uh, recyclable waste. Um, can I have the last slide here, Francis? Thanks. What I've also included in the packet is a list of some people that you can contact, different agencies around the community that work with non-hazardous materials. I've included the household hazardous waste collection area, uh, just for your own personal information, if you have some extra paint, uh, aerosols, um, bat car batteries, you can have up to five gallons or 50 pounds of that material uh, be recycled for you. All you have to do is take it to one of the collection centers. And I've also included on there the Environmental Federation of, of Los Angeles, which is a good umbrella organization for a number of agencies involved in environmental affairs in the Los Angeles community. Uh, it's getting on toward lunch, and I know there are a couple of other speakers yet, so I'm not going to hog the time here. Thank you. A couple of things. The Environmental Federation of California, that's 310, I think, since it's Santa Monica, not 213, area code. Oh, <laughs> also in your packet, besides Mark's um, Notes up here is uh, the California Recycling Guides uh, list, so you can you can find in there different uh, places to get recycling done. Our next speaker is Terry Kennedy. Terry is a contractor who's been specializing in sustainable building, and he'll review a few products that he's worked with and give you his uh, his trials and tribulations, and pluses and minuses. Where is Terry? Ah, okay. <laughs> Polly um, asked me to uh, get into the pitfalls that you run into after you get out in the field. Um, I've been estimating for a long time and building and um, I think the first pitfall I ever had was in uh, about around, I can't remember when it was, but I think it was around 1967. Um, we recycled, uh, when Columbia Records bought discount records, we recycled a barn that was gonna be torn down. And I forgot that when I uh, took the siding, too much of the siding off, it had fallen my truck and I lost a real nice Chevy pickup to that barn. But we got a beautiful storefront on Telegraph Avenue. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what I'm driving at is I think that uh, I like this subject because I think there's a myth around that uh, I hear a lot that you can't uh, build sustainably uh, because it's too expensive. And um, a lot of people have touched on that today. Well, I agree with that. I mean, I don't agree with that, excuse me. <laughs> I, uh, I've done a lot of, a uh, heck of a lot of estimating for a long time. And I really think that, I mean, for instance, the paints, you can get them as low as, you know, $12, $14 a gallon. And of course, they run way up and 
on up in cost, but all the way through uh, the whole breakdown of a project, I think that uh, if you're careful in pre-planning, I think that you can actually um, bring uh, the prices in really well at this time. The problems happen with these pitfalls, uh, in my experience. Like I said, I lost that truck, and then later we were building, a, we recycled a, some warehouses in the 70s. Uh, we recycled a warehouse on, in Boston and took it down to Martha's Vineyard and built a black dog restaurant. And uh, we hadn't thought through how much, how many saw blades we'd lose uh, in all this old recycled pine or how hard it would be to put the splines into the flooring and a whole lot of labor things um, with that one. Then later, uh, again in the Bay Area, I had a project where uh, I had to, they wanted me to uh, put, uh, take a bunch of old fur, some beautiful big old fur beams, and uh, not only do the post and timber work, but also do a lot of the trim and so we could recycle those beams back in. Well, I, I said, sure, okay, no problem. And then I turned out that nobody would resaw. I couldn't find any uh, thin dimensions of the one by 12, you know, like one by 12s or one by six. All I could get was timber. And I couldn't get anybody to resaw it because uh, a resaw is a big saw with huge blades on it. So I had to buy a resaw up in the Pacific Northwest uh, in order to get this lumber. Of course, you could get the lumber so cheap that I, it worked out all right. But the, the point on all of this is that for the design person to work carefully with a builder, or at least with a builder in mind, and to maybe make a good checklist. Uh, I've prepared a, a cursory checklist not a really good thorough one but uh, because of time limitations, but I prepared a, a cursory checklist that I've got out in the lobby and that I'll have some copies of at the round tables that kind of lists different um, overview type of things for you to prepare a checklist of possible pitfalls, things like Eve mentioned and other things. Some of those more up-to-date, you know, besides the more uh, old ones like recycled lumber that I've run into. Um, for instance, medite. Medite's a good example. Well, you get it out, and it's, uh, it's wonderful that it does an off-gas formaldehyde, but if you sand the surface on it and use a water-based paint, it tends to float little hairs up on it. Uh, and that can be, a, that's an example of the types of little think-through things that you need to work out ahead of, ahead of time so you don't have the builder coming back and harassing you or the owner or the principal of the project for more money. Um, uh, another thing with Medite, this is a little think-through that you wouldn't, wouldn't dawn on you go, wow, great, no formaldehyde, but where do, how do you get laminates glued up on it? Right? And how do you get a good, thick, beautiful, one of these lovely veneers from Perpetual Hardwoods, how do you get that glued up on it? Where do you do that? That's a think through. Uh, where do you get medite locally? You know, you can't run right down to a local, to Fisher Malibu or somebody and find medite in. So you're going to have transportation costs involved in it. Um, another example, um, uh, of things, um, oh, well, one thing Polly asked me to bring up is modifications. We just worked on a project recently where um, we were asked to make it as sustainable as possible. And in the think through, we, uh, we brought in some big drainage pipe, some big, huge, pretty good sized drainage system. And um, we said, oh yeah, wow, we'll use recycled plastic pipe. Excellent, wonderful idea. But when you go through the think through, it turns out that to get the pipe in out of North Carolina, 
you'd have to pay $9,000 in freight, the only place in the country where I could find it, a good size, a real drainage system type of pipe made that way. So we ended up having to spend a tremendous amount of energy uh, negotiating with other vendors to cut that $9,000 in freight out to make it viable for the project. Well, then you can go to the city and get a modification, right, if you're going to use a project, uh, a product that's weird. You can go in and go down to the research and engineering division and pay a certain fee and make things happen and get a modification. Well, we got a modification on this product, but the engineers were not familiar with it that were on site. So we relieved the overburden in some excavation nearby, and we've got water coming out of this. Well, that's normal in a piping system. You always have exfiltration from the piping system uh, if you relieve the overburden that keeps the balance in the pipe system. Uh, but the engineers were afraid of the product, and the city was afraid of the product, so I had a we had to go through a large, very large, expensive, time-consuming workout to get a correction notice signed off after we'd been given a modification. Polly's waving at me, and I'm sure you're uh, starving and your arms uh, <clears throat> are tired, and we're all ready to go on, so I'll uh, go ahead and wrap up. Uh, the one closing thought is to think through the project and pre-plan and think through each one of these carefully uh, for the sake of the principles of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Julia Russell is our last speaker of the morning uh, from Eco Home. Thanks uh, very much, Polly. I want to say I'm just thrilled to be here at the uh, first conference on um, sustainable building materials of the ADPSR. It uh, puts me in mind of, I think it was 1983, I attended the first Xeriscape conference down in Costa Mesa. And there were scattered <laughs> people in a small auditorium. And um, by the end of the 80s, um, the Xeriscape conferences were thousands of people, and um, there were two of them annually, one in Northern California, one in Southern California. So I am feeling today as though I'm um, at the first of another one of these um, growing phenomena, which will uh, grow very rapidly every year, and I would predict by the end of the 90s, we're going to have, the ADPSR is going to have to have more than one uh, sustainable building uh, materials conference per year, and it will be all over the country. Um, it, it is a very exciting uh, thing to have been in on the very beginnings of uh, thinking and planning for sustainability back in the early 70s when I started Echo Home, because I'm able to see the enormous growth that has occurred in really any very short time, uh, considering um, the whole history of our human evolution and the fact that we are really making giant strides very quickly towards seeing that as a species, we really need to design our man-made life support systems so they work in alignment with the Earth's life support systems. And everyone here is doing their part to move us in that direction. I started back in the 70s by simply addressing my own lifestyle at Echo Home. And um, slowly it evolved into a nonprofit, tax exempt organization, which has uh, a demonstration home available for uh, public tours once a week, showing how. As individuals, we can design our lifestyles to uh, live in uh, harmony or in balance with nature, even in an urban environment. And um, we also have created, over the years, uh, accumulated vast resources, information resources. And so we also serve as a, a community information resource on environmental 
building environmental systems. And um, that's something that I hope that you will uh, access us for. Um, in your packets, you will find um, a listing of resources that are available uh, at Echo Home on sustainable living, uh, all different aspects of sustainable living. And as you all know, this field is growing and changing very, very rapidly. <laughs> so this is, this is the present incarnation, but in two weeks it's going to have uh, additions to it, and in two weeks from that time, uh, more additions. And um, it's quite, quite a challenge to s stay up with it, which is why I think a resource center is so valuable to you professionals who are very busy doing and uh, it may be difficult for you to stay up to date on what, uh, are, what things are available, what systems and what techniques and what materials are available uh, to help you meet environmental criteria uh, in, your, in your projects. So we hope that we can help you do that. Now, I am here today with uh, a lot of the resources that we have available. I'm not going to really talk about that now. We'll save that for the round table where I can lay them all out and we can really get specific about uh, some of them. But I do want to just um, observe something I think probably you've all uh, observed yourself, which is there seems to be two streams in the development of new products and new technologies. Uh, one has to do with health, non-toxic products, and um, non-VOC products. Others have to do with resource conservation. And um, most of the resources are either one or the other. And so as practitioners, you're required to bring them together, which is a very, very uh, complex uh, job. And I see an opportunity for someone <laughs> uh, to come come out with a resource guide that brings those two streams together so that when you're specifying something from that resource, you know it's not only resource conserving, but it also will not poison the inhabitants of the structure that you're building. Uh, so that's a need that I see that really should be fulfilled. Um, I, we do, as I say, we have public tours at Echo Home. I hope that you will uh, take advantage of that. Here's our brochure. Please pick one up on the outside. Um, uh, also, I just want to mention, on June 19th, at John Picard's home, Echo Home and John Picard are um, joining forces to give a little mini conference, a little mini seminar on environmentally sound um, building products. And uh, we hope that you will join us for that. And um, with that, I'm going to send you all to lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're going to have lunch, and we will start the round tables at 1 o'clock. You can bring your lunch to the round tables if you like. Um, Garth Sheriff has a few announcements. Um, just before we break, very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people that I didn't get a chance to earlier. Um, here today, and I hope he's still here, um, I want you to uh, meet the president of the Orange County chapter of ADPSR, Kermit Dorius, is back there. If any of you are in the Orange County or San Diego areas and you want to join ADPSR, excuse me, you may want to talk to Kermit. Uh, he is uh, one of the uh, strong supporters and I believe co-founders of the EOS Institute, which is represented out on our literature uh, table through their publication, Earthward. And I want to properly... Um, have you joined me in a round of applause for Polly Osborne, without which we couldn't have had this conference. Uh, and now, just briefly, as you go out to have lunch, there is, all the way through the trade show and publications table, uh, the Cafe by Angeli, uh, and they are prepared to feed uh, some or all of us. There is, at 1 o'clock, a uh, entrepreneurially uh, occupied culinary mo mobile uh, vehicle, aka lunch truck, which will show up outside Angelis. Um, and there are restaurants within five minutes of here, but we would like to gather back as close to one o'clock as possible. We'll have the round tables set up at that time. 
In the packets that you got today, very briefly, on the left-hand side are reprints from articles from the Boston uh, Seminar on Sustainable Materials in October of 92. And on the right-hand side, the agenda and materials from this conference. One thing that I do want to point out, there is a uh, booklet uh, advising you that you can subscribe to the AIA's Environmental Resource Guide. It's quite expensive, 195 for AIA members. Uh, more than $200 for non-members, but you'll notice there's a little line in there that says bulk rate $145. Anybody who feels they want to pay that bulk rate, and this, uh, by the way, John Picard is giving me the Environmental Resource Guide. It is, it is worth $1,000 if you have it, but it's expensive at $200 if you don't have it. Um, but if you can't afford the $145, all you have to do is sign up at the publications table in the trade show. It's the table all the way to the back, and there's a sign-up list there. And just put next to your name, would like ERG at bulk rate, and ADPSR will send for as many guides as we have sign-ups at the $145 rate and get them to you with no shipping charges. Um, so with that in mind, I just have one other thing to say. Um, today... Um, uh, Ray Cappy was to have awarded Estelle Brisker, a founding member of ADPSR and our past president, the Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, uh, ADPSR. She would have been one of only uh, four or five people to get that award. And in fact, it was given to her uh, in the hospital last week where she had been fighting cancer for, many of you know, for over four years had risen to a respected and influential member of the wellness community. Estelle, as a professor at UCLA and Cal State Long Beach, touched many of the lives in this room that weren't involved with ADPSR. She passed away a week ago yesterday at 4.30 in the morning. And as I said yesterday at a memorial service, um, I am somewhat of an imposter by saying I am the president of ADPSR because Estelle always has been and always will be the spiritual head of our organization. And uh, as you wander through the various things that we have for you outside and as you come back for event after event, none of this probably would ever have happened, at least under the banner of ADPSR, without Estelle Brisker. And so I just wanted to mention that. I hope you enjoy your lunch and we'll see you for the roundtables.